Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome evening, to the 109th episode of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists webinars. It's a great pleasure to be uh, introducing our college to the delegates and the members who are attending the webinar. At this, the ICA has start, had started the webinar series two years ago during the COVID, and they have been successfully conducted every Wednesday with different topics. We've had expert speakers, not only from our country, but abroad, and we've had a variety of discussion for this one and a half hour sessions that we have every week. We've had case discussions, we have had core anesthesia topics, PG debates, and a whole lot of participation by the speakers, the faculty, as well as the students. And uh, I'm sure the students are giving a very good feedback to us, which actually keeps us going. So before introducing today's topic, I'd like to inform everybody that next, in the month of November, we are going to be holding the ICA Con 2022. This is the National Conference of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Okay. This is going to be the 13th annual oh. Oh. National oh. and International oh. College of Anesthesiologists. This is going to be know. held I, I in the Government the Medical like College here. and Hospital like Chandigarh, uh, India. And uh, the chairperson is Dr. Sukanya Mitra. First speaker ke the topic ke is technology in anesthesia, science with a human face. So it's going to be a very um, interactive conference with workshops and a two-day conference. And I would request all of you to register for it timely. Next week, we are going to, this of course is the, these are the details of the, the website for the conference. It has been uh, as I said, conducted by the Government Medical College Chandigarh. And uh, these are the emails and the websites. You can go through it and get the details. The registration uh, fees, etc., will be available on the website and you can all go through it. The weather will be very nice at this time. And I suggest that you all do your registrations and booking on time. Now coming to the next week's program, Faraz, please turn the slide. These are the registration fees, which you can see an early bird, of course, I'm sure will still be applicable. Next slide, please. So what about next week? These are the programs of the conference, plenary lectures, panel discussions, orations, oral and poster sessions for the students and how I do it sessions as well. Next for us. Yes, so this is the, uh, the conference. Next, please. Next week's program, which we are going to have, is going to be the ICA PG, PG Conclave. And in this, what I would like to tell all the faculty, yes, please, that this is the platform we have given to the postgraduate students where they can present their views on how they would like the anesthesia education to go ahead. So they will be speaking to us and we, some of the experts on the panel will be giving our advice to them. So it's again going to be very interesting for the youngsters and I request all the postgraduates to join this conclave. Coming to today's program, this is a very important webinar today and the cleft anomalies and their management. Whenever we have a case of cleft palate, even we ensure that they are experienced anesthesiologists who are giving the anesthesia to them. They should be skilled, not only pediatric anesthesiologists, but also the, uh, the anesthesiologists who understand the whole uh, pathophysiology of cleft palate. For this, we have very eminent faculty, of course, and our moderator is none else but Dr. Professor Baljeet Singh, who is the founder member, trustee, and CEO of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. He is the ex-director professor, Department of Anesthesiology, GB Pant Hospital. And at present, he is in the SGT Medical College and Hospital Research Institute at Gurgaon. Welcome, Dr. Baljeet, and I would like you to take over this webinar. Thank you very much. 
thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think there's some problem with my video. So uh, kindly bear with me. Uh, after the program starts, then I'll log out uh, and then, uh, you know, come back again. Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you so much once again for introducing the topic for the day and uh, creating you uh, this, uh, this cleft anomalies. And, uh, uh, you know, the cleft anomalies are nearly one third of all craniofacial anomalies uh, as far as incidence is concerned. And uh, the incidence of uh, cleft defects are more uh, in, in Asian countries rather than uh, the Western cultures. Uh, the incidence in Indian culture on different studies that we can see is uh, one in uh, 600 to one in seven or 800. Uh, whereas in the West, in the America, it's somewhere, uh, you know, one in 14 uh, to one in uh, 2,000 uh, cases uh, there. Uh, you see, there are a lot of problems which are associated with cleft anomalies, uh, particularly for the child. Uh, you know, there, is, there are issues with regard to the feeding. The weight gain is uh, not appropriate. There is repeated chest infection because of regurgitation every now and then, particularly with cleft palate cases, uh, infections of the ear and uh, the poor growth, as I said. Apart from that, there is a lot of social stigma which is associated with the cleft uh, patients. You know, uh, the society doesn't accept them, school children ridicule them, so a lot of psychological issues which also come up. So to discuss uh, these uh, uh, issues, uh, you know, we have very uh, uh, young, but very experienced uh, three uh, anesthesiologists uh, on the panel. Uh, the first speaker would be Dr. Pono Motiani, and uh, she will be speaking on cleft lip and palate, and she'll be discussing about the anatomy, physiology, and the pathological concerns. Uh, second will be Dr. Yu Singh, and she would be taking up anesthetic consideration of cleft lip and cleft palate surgery. And the third uh, in that sequence will be Dr. Ekta Gupta. Uh, she will be speaking on pain management for cleft surgeries. Uh, Dr. Poonu Motiani is the additional professor of pediatric anesthesia at the Postgraduate Institute of Child Health in Noida. And uh, she has initiated pediatric anesthesia services as uh, head of the department since uh, 2015. She is uh, Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship uh, initiated in, 2000, uh, in 2020. And uh, she has pediatric anesthesia fellowship at Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital London, which is one of the premier institutions uh, with, uh, as far as pediatric uh, patients are concerned. And she's uh, chairman of the Oxygen Monitoring Committee uh, from April uh, two, uh, 2021 till date. Uh, she has organized uh, various conferences, a lot of publications she has, and uh, her areas of interest remain pediatric anesthesia and pediatric a difficult airway. Over to you, Dr. Motiani, uh, for your talk. Thank you so much, sir. A very good evening, respected seniors, colleagues, and friends. At the outset, I would like to thank ICA and the organizers, Professor Jeshri Sood, ma'am, and our moderator, Professor Baljeet Singh, for inviting me to speak at this forum. Without wasting any time, I'll go on to the topic. My topic is cleft lip and palate, and I'll be dealing with the anatomy, physiology, and the pathophysiological concerns. I, um, yes. The, the learning goals of my talk today would be uh, to look at the differences in the adult and the pediatric airway with its implications, the specific anatomical and physiological concerns with respect to cleft lip and palate, the epidemiology, the relevant embryology, the associated concerns, and the classification. So coming to the anatomical and physiological aspects of the pediatric airway and its implications, uh, we all know that children have a uh, head which is proportionately larger. They have a prominent occiput and a short neck. Because of this, they are predisposed to airway obstruction when they are asleep. In addition, infants below the age of five months are obligate nasal breathers. And so any nasal secretions or presence of a nasogastric tube can also hamper the respiration. The tongue in children is large. It is difficult to manipulate. And along with uh, a shorter mandible, this leads to loss of upper airway space and makes laryngoscopy more difficult in children. Coming to the epiglottis, the epiglottis in children is narrower, floppier, longer, omega shaped, angled away from the trachea, making it difficult to lift it using a Macintosh blade. 
sewer straight blade in children is preferred. The laryngeal inlet the is uh, the laryngeal cartilages are uh, greater in size than the inlet and they have a low muscle tone. So this already makes them vulnerable to collapse during inspiration. The larynx is also cephalic and the angle of the vocal cords is more ob oblique. This itself hampers the laryngoscopic view and the endotracheal tube may impinge on the anterior commissure. Coming to the tracheal anatomy, the trachea in children is proportionately, it's disproportionately smaller. It is about five, four centimeter in neonates. As a result, they are more prone to endobronchial intubation and accidental extubation. Also, the flexible cartilaginous tracheal rings make it more prone to dynamic obstruction with negative pressure ventilation in children. Uh, coming to the bronchi, the bronchi in children are equally ankled and more so in neonates, uh, which makes aspiration equally possible on either side. Coming to the narrowest portion of the pediatric airway, traditionally we have been taught that subglottis is the narrowest portion of the neonatal or the pediatric airway and the pediatric larynx or cricoid is funnel shaped and uncuffed tubes have been advocated. More recently, MRI studies and bronchoscopic studies have identified that the narrowest portion in neonates and in children is also the transverse diameter of the vocal cords. Coming to the uh, differences in respiratory physiology as compared to adults, children have a lower lung volume and capacity and general anesthesia further decreases the FRC. As a result, they have a limited oxygen reserve, lower apnea tolerance, and even adequate pre-oxygenation does not prevent desaturation. Also, they have an increased oxygen consumption and increased metabolic rate. Therefore, early desaturation will complicate difficult airway management. Further, their chest wall is more compliant and the lung is less compliant than an adult. So, it is mandatory to give IPPV during anesthesia and PEEP so as to prevent lung collapse. Coming to the uh, caliber of the airway in children and in neonates, the, there is a very low caliber airway. As a result of this, the airway resistance is much greater. So even a small amount of edema, as little as one millimeter in infants and neonates, can lead to a disproportionate increase in the resistance and increase in the work of breathing. Further, the, in children, the tidal volume is relatively fixed because the bucket handle action is not performed by the horizontal ribs and the minute volume becomes largely respiratory rate deficient. The diaphragm is the uh, primary muscle of ventilation and any uh, uh, condition in which there is a poor bag mass ventilation or bulky abdomen, this can impair the ventilation. Further, the percentage of type 1 skeletal muscle fibers, which are the slow resistant, fatigue resistant uh, fibers, this is much lower in children as compared to adults. Also, the protective airway reflexes in children are not developed, though they have very active laryngeal reflexes. So, though they may not uh, be, uh, they may not have very active uh, airway reflexes in the form of vomiting and coughing, but laryngospasm occurs even with the minimum amount of chemical or mechanical stimulation. Neonates, particularly uh, premature infants, are more prone to respiratory distress syndrome and uh, post-operative apneas are relatively uh, more common in premature infants. So now coming to uh, the topic that is cleft lip and palate. Now, orofacial clefts includes the cleft lip, the cleft palate, or both of them occurring together. In a cleft lip, there is an opening in the upper limb which may in the upper lip which may extend up to the nose it may be unilateral bilateral or it may be complete uh, this is primarily because of uh, failure of fusion of the maxillary prominence and medial nasal processes we'll come to embryology in a minute in the cleft palate there is a defect in the palate so the defect can be in the soft palate in the hard palate or it can be a complete defect uh, along with the split uvula. And this occurs because of failure of fusion of the lateral palatine processes or the uh, failure of uh, in the formation of the secondary palate. Now, cleft lip palate affects in about one to 700, uh, one in 700 birds, and there is wide variation across the geographic origin. Asian and American uh, population have the highest prevalence, which is as high as one in 500 and African populations have the lowest at about one in 2,500. 
between the males and the females, males have a higher preponderance for cleft lip and palate and isolated palates are more common in females. Uh, for, uh, coming to the side, a left side uh, clefting is more common than a right side, which is more common than a bilateral cleft. Now the etiology of face, orofacial clefts. The etiology is largely polygenic and multifactorial. There are various genetic factors involved. There are various environmental factors involved and the gene environment interactions. So most of these clefts can be associated with a syndrome or some may be not associated with a syndrome. Now, this is a list of uh, exhaustive list of syndromes which are associated with cleft lip or palate. The more common ones are the Van de Wood syndrome, which is again a syndrome which involves various craniofacial deformities, the Treacher Collins syndrome, the Pierre Rodman syndrome, and the Stickler syndrome. Cleft lip and palate is also associated with trisomy 13 and with Down syndrome. There are various genes, genetic variants, which are associated with this syndrome, and this is a list of some of them. This is a view of the, some of the conditions which are associated with the cleft lip palate, the Van de Wood syndrome, the Treacher Collins syndrome, and the Pierre Robin sequence. Some more uh, 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 patients which have uh, various congenital malformations, including a cleft lip. So, coming to the environmental factors. Now, usually it is an interplay of the genetic as well as the environmental factors, which leads to the presence of a cleft lip or palate in a child. So uh, the, it is the intensity, the duration, and the time of exposure uh, is very important. Infections such as rubella or toxoplasmosis in the mother, radiation exposure, growth hormone deficiency, maternal hypoxia caused by maternal smoking, maternal alcohol use, maternal hypertension treatment, pesticide exposure, drugs such as steroids, anticonvulsants. Anticonvulsants have a 10% increased incidence, nitrate compounds, aspirin, and certain psychoactive drugs. These have all been associated with uh, as the environmental factors which are associated with the presence of a cleft lip or palate. Another important factor is presence of folic acid or B12 deficiency. Now coming to the embryology, an interplay of the morphogenetic factors is involved in the formation of a cleft lip palate. Now the usual craniofacial development in a child occurs about six to eight weeks of uh, the human life. So in a three to four week embryo, the migration of the neural crest cells occurs from the anterior neuropore around the stomatidium towards the brachial arches. And this leads to Formation of the frontonasal prominence, the one in blue, the maxillary prominence processes, the one in green, and the mandibular processes. So uh, this occurs about the fourth week of embryogenesis. By the fifth week of embryogenesis, there is formation of the nasal pits. And these nasal pits divide the frontonasal prominence into the medial nasal process and the lateral nasal processes. By the end of the sixth week, the medial nasal process they fuse with each other and they form the upper lip and whereas the lateral nasal process forms the ella of the nose. The mandibular processes fuse together to form the lower jaw. So any uh, mutation or any genetic uh, uh, environmental influence that occurs in the embryo in this period from the fourth till about the seventh week it will lead to clefting of the lip. Now coming to the the uh, sixth week of embryogenesis, a secondary plate develops from the maxillary processes as bilateral outgrowth, outgrowth and it grows vertically down the sides of the tongue. And by the seventh week, these shells elevate to a horizontal position above the tongue, make contact with one another and begin to fuse. By about the tenth week, the fusion occurs and uh, this leads to formation of the uh, uh, secondary palate. So any a mutation which occurs in this period from about the fifth week till about the twelfth week may lead to a presence of a cleft palate. Now, just to recapitulate, the uh, uh, the frontonasal prominence develops into the forehead, the bridge of the nose, the medial and the lateral nasal processes. The medial nasal forms the philtrum of the upper lip, the tip of the nose. The lateral nasal forms the ella of the nose. The maxillary process forms the lateral portion of the upper lip. 
and the mandibular process forms the lower limb. Now coming to the problems that are associated with these conditions. As uh, sir has already said, there are various problems which can be associated uh, with the clefting of the lip and the palate. First is the dentition. Uh, the tooth development is delayed. There may be fused, missing or extra teeth. The enamel becomes hypomineralized and hypoplastic. As a result, tooth decay is more likely. Because of the presence of clefting, it is difficult to maintain oral hygiene. Therefore, it leads to presence of increased cavities in these children. There will be mandibular uh, prognathism and malocclusion may occur. Coming to the feeding problems, because there is a cleft between the mouth and the nose or between the lip and the nose, this will lead to develop, the child will not be able to develop adequate suction. So there'll be a weaker sucking and a weaker swallowing. And if the child is nursed in a relatively supine position, there will be nasal regurgitation. So therefore, an upright position is required for nursing and uh, use of uh, specialized equipment such as the herbimin feeder is required uh, for feeding these children. Hearing loss can occur in these children because of recurrent middle ear infections and also because of presence of angled and tortuous eustachian tubes. Because of compromised hearing, these children also develop learning difficulties. Then there are speech problems which can also develop because the use of the lip and the palate and the tongue are all required to generate adequate sounds. So there might be retardation of consonants, there'll be hypernasal tone and articulation defects. The other nasal problems include the ella are flared and the columella is pushed to the non-cleft side. Various uh, anomalies are associated with this condition which may include congenital heart disease, mental retardation. And because of presence of all these problems, uh, there may be development of psychosocial issues in the child. This may lead to decrease in the child's self-esteem, social skills and behavioral problems. So based on these, it is, and uh, on the uh, surgical outcome, various uh, intervention, the timing of intervention has been defined. In the intrauterine life, the cleft lip diagnosis can be made by the ultrasound examination. Prenatally, it is imperative for the parents to discuss with the surgeon and also to get uh, consultation with the geneticist to see whether any other problems are associated. Neonatal, uh, in the neonatal period, the feeding instructions have to be given. Pre-surgical orthopedics are used. By 12 weeks of age, cleft lip surgery is advised. And by six to 12 months of age, a cleft lip repair is advised. At around 14 years of later, uh, orthognathic surgery is advised and by adulthood, secondary rhinoplasty is advised in these children. So some of the protocols that have been advised include the rule of 10 for cleft lip. It is recommended that a child should be at least 10 pounds uh, of weight, 10 grams of hemoglobin, 10 weeks of age and a TLC around 10,000 or less. For pallets, uh, the age is uh, about 10 months of age, 10 kg weight, 10 gram hemoglobin and TLC should be not more than 10,000. Now coming to the classification of the cleft lip and palate. Now cleft lip and palate is an umbrella term and it includes a heterogeneous collection of orofacial clefts, which can include a cleft lip, a cleft lip and alveolus, cleft lip, alveolus and palate, etc. So there have been various classifications which have been proposed for classifying the lift and the palate deformity. So based on the laterality, uh, the lip may be clefted in the center, then it is known as a median cleft lip, or it may be on one or both sides, then it becomes a, a, a unilateral a paramedian, uh, the cleft lip. Then uh, coming to the severity of the cleft lip, the clefting may be either complete, incomplete, or lesser full, uh, lesser forms may include a microform or a mini microform type of severity. It may be symmetric severity bilaterally or asymmetric. Now, there have been various other classifications that have been proposed. Based on the morphology, the view classification was given by view et al. in the year 1931, in which the group A defects were defined as those in which there was only defect in the soft palate. Group B or two were defined as defects in which there was defect of the hard palate along with the defect of the soft palate, but not ex uh, extending further than the incisive foramen. 
the group C or the group uh, three category, it included the complete unilateral cleft extending from the soft palate and to the alveolus, usually involving the lip. And the group D or the four included bilateral cleft. Uh, uh, in, uh, and it was similar to three, except that it was bilateral. Another classification of the cleft lip and palate was according to the pictorial notation, the Kernahan stripe Y diagram. And this was uh, to you, uh, this illustrated the anatomically, uh, the anatomic involvement and the severity. And, but now with the use of, diminished use of electronic health records, its popularity has decreased. Herein, the classification was based on numbering the structures and the, based on the, uh, from, from the right side to the left side, right lip was labeled as one, right alveolus was two, right premaxilla was three, and so on. So uh, the pictorial classification was made and the uh, part which was affected was colored appropriately. Another classification that was, uh, that has been followed is the Larshall classification, wherein Larshall uh, represents a palindrome which represents the anatomical structures proceeding from the patient's right side towards the left side. So L stands for right lip, A stands for al right alveolus, H stands for heart palate, H S stands for midline soft palate, and so on. And here, every column is filled with either a letter or an uh, symbol, and it confirms the involvement of the part in the severity. So if it's a capital letter, it means that the anatomic feature was completely clefted. If it's a lower case, it means it is incompletely clefted. If it is an asterisk, it means there is minimal clefting. And if it's a dot, it indicates that the anatomic feature is normally developed. So for example, LAHS, uh, three dots would indicate, uh, like in the first uh, column, a right uh, unilateral complete cleft lip with a co complete cleft alveolus and a complete unilateral view three type of cleft palate. The other classification based on the phenotype is the CLAP notification. Here again, the uh, classification uh, has been used wherein uh, the capital letters LAP, they signify clefting and absence of capitalization signifies a normal anatomy. For the laterality and severity, a lowercase prefix is added. So for laterality, U indicates unilateral, B indicates bilateral. And for severity, C indicates complete, I indicates incomplete, and M indicates a lesser form. Coming to the uh, anatomic involvement, L indicates the lip, A for alveolus, and P for palate. And uh, for the severity, the uh, suffix is uh, added in the form of V1, uh, V2, V3, and so on. And uh, so coming, uh, for example, a small UC, capital C LA indicates a unilateral complete cleft lip and alveolus. So our take home message would be that the prerequisite of a good clinical practice includes understanding the anatomical and physiological differences, the specific concerns and the associated comorbidities of any disease. And I request the moderator to kindly invite the next speaker to carry the discussion forward. Thank you for patient hearing and greetings from my institute. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Motiani, uh, for uh, a you know, excellent coverage of uh, the topic that you had uh, basically uh, related to anatomy physiology of uh, these children. And I'm sure this would set a perfect stage for the next speaker to come in, Dr. Ranju Singh. Uh, Dr. Ranju Singh, who doesn't know her? Uh, she is a director professor uh, NSCA at Lady Hardy Medical College and Associated Hospitals. And uh, her area of interest, of course, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is pediatric anesthesia. Uh, Dr. Anjusen, can you share your uh, screen? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Kindly share your screen, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, she is uh, one of the founders of the Delhi Tepra of Indian Association for uh, 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 Pediatric Anesthesiologists and uh, currently the president of Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthetists of the Delhi Chapter. And she is vice president of uh, Delhi Chapter of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. 
uh, very well seen faces where face uh, you know uh, wherever there are eha accredited bls and acls courses are conducted she is an instructor there she is a senior faculty of airway management foundation uh, of india and uh, apart from that she is an instructor at national teachers <coughs> training program as well examiner for md dnb da <coughs> all kinds uh, assessor for national board of examinations and uh, for the national medical commission as well <coughs> Uh, she is reviewed with national and uh, international uh, journals of repute, and she has more than 200 presentations and lectures in national and various international conferences. She has publications more than 60 in national and international journals, and uh, uh, quite a few chapters in the books as well. Dr. Anju uh, would be speaking on uh, anesthetic consideration for cleft lip and cleft palate surgery, and uh, Dr. Anju, the stage is now yours. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Baljeet, sir, and thank you, Jeshri, ma'am, for giving me an opportunity to talk about a topic which I clearly hold very dear to my heart. And uh, uh, for all the residents who are listening in, uh, I would just like to emphasize at the beginning of the talk that probably uh, a plain lip or a palate, uh, uncomplicated, may not seem to have too many anesthetic implications. But as you develop your practice and keep giving anesthesia to these cases over and over again and build your experience, you realize how very, very small things in your anesthetic practice can profoundly affect the outcome. And through my talk, I would like to emphasize these very small things which actually make the outcome far better if you know them rather than when not. So we'll be talking about anesthetic challenges in lip and palate, and I will be restricting my talk only to the anesthetic management because Dr. Poonam has very beautifully and exhaustively dealt with all the physiological and anatomical challenges that we see in these patients. Now, every time you anesthetize these children, remember that you alone are not responsible for their well-being. There is a multidisciplinary team which is actually required to ensure optimal care of these patients, which includes otolaryngologists, pediatric or plastic surgeons, speech therapists, occupational therapists, dentists, orthodontists, and of course, anesthesiologists. Now, where all is an anesthesiologist involved in the management of these cleft lip and cleft palate patients? Of course, these patients require general anesthesia for the primary surgical repair, but many a times you might be required to intervene in the airway management of these patients before surgery. You may have a patient uh, in the nursery for which you get a call. You may get a call from the emergency department. The pediatricians might like your help to manage the complicated airway of these patients well before surgery. Many of these patients undergo repeated surgeries and few of these surgeries do carry on into adulthood. So you will encounter these patients in adulthood if they undergo procedures such as closure of residual palatal defects, the alignment of alveolar and dental defects, realignment of the jaws and correction of nasal deformity. Also, surgery for otitis media, or non-cleft related anomalies is not uncommon in this category of patients. Now I've divided the anesthetic challenges into three broad heads uh, to enable the residents to enumerate them better. These include problems related to the fact that the patient belongs to a pediatric age group, problems which are specific to the disease per se, and problems arising out of other congenital anomalies which these patients might have. Uh, the pediatric age group problems have already been highlighted by Dr. Uh, Poonam. They could be anatomical, physiological, pharmacological, or equipment related. And the fact that these cases need to be done by somebody with experience in managing pediatric cases. Now let's come to the disease specific problems which we will see in these patients. A large majority of patients with cleft lip and particularly with cleft palate come to you with evidence of upper respiratory tract infection. They have chronic rhinorrhea, and when they come to you in the PSC, they will either have overt or a history of recurrent upper respiratory tract infection. As Dr. Poonam has highlighted, 
due to the reflux of food into the nasal passages. These patients are prone to repeated infections. Sometimes LRTI also occurs. The children, because of defect in the palatal musculature and because of defect in the functioning of the institution tube, also are prone to middle ear effusions and recurrent otitis media, which further increases the incidence of URI in these children. Now, because of the increased incidence of URIs, these patients eventually develop a higher incidence of post-operative respiratory complications, what we will abbreviate as PRCs. And these PRCs are the ones which create problem for you during the conduct of anesthesia. A higher incidence of laryngospasm, bronchospasm, desaturation, breath holding, and post-intubation crew is seen in these patients undergoing anesthesia. And it is important to remember that the risk of these PRCs increase with severity of the defect. Bilateral defects, larger defects, those associated with multiple anomalies are the ones in which a higher incidence of PRCs is seen. Also because of upper respiratory tract infections being so common in these children and so repeated, these patients have a low-grade pyrexemia, and this is what results in impaired wound healing after they undergo surgery. Now, this is a very interesting paper, which I thought I'll include because we are repeatedly talking about URIs. So which patients do you actually take and which do you do not take for the fact that they are having URI? You remember that URI is actually a result of the disease pathology. And the surgery is in fact corrected, which means that the incidence of rhinorrhea will go down in patients who have a surgical correction. So you need to identify those patients who are at a higher risk of developing respiratory tract infections and complications as a result of this URI. So in this very, very beautiful paper by Teat et al., which was published approximately 20 years ago, but is still relevant, the authors have outlined the independent risk factors in children having URI that result in adverse respiratory events. These include use of an endotracheal tube, age less than five years, a history of prematurity, history of reactive airway disease in the child, history of parental smoking, if the surgery involves the airway, the presence of copious secretions, nasal congestions, and fever. Many of these factors might be present at the time when the child presents to you for surgery. So you will be able to categorize whether these patients have an active URI that can cause trouble or it is just a low-grade chronic rhinorrhea which can be accepted. The best thing to do I've learned over the years is to ask the parents, ask the mother, how is the child? Is this the baseline URI which the child always have? Or at the time when she presents uh, the child for a PAC, is the child sicker than what he normally is? This paper was very beautifully followed by an editorial which confirmed the fact that the presence of copious secretions, nasal congestion, and a reactive airway disease definitely increases the incidence of perioperative respiratory events. So remember that on one side, we are saying that rhinorrhea is chronic, very common, almost persistent in these children, and probably surgery is corrective. On the other hand, I would like to emphasize that the features which are outlined, you must be uh, able to identify these red flags that these are the children in which the URI needs to be corrected before the child is taken up for surgery. So to minimize the incidence of PRCs, if the child has active severe URI, you must postpone this elective surgery for a duration of approximately four weeks. And if the child is having repeated URIs or you are anesthetizing the child after an episode of severe URI, it is preferable that an experienced pediatric anesthesiologist deliver the anesthetic. Also, it has been noticed that even if these children are clinically well, pre-op antibiotics for children even with low-grade infection does reduce the incidence of PRC. That is, it takes care of the low-grade pyrexemia, which these children have, and many surgeons prefer giving them pre-op antibiotics. 
The other major problem besides upper respiratory tract infection is the fact that these children are classified as difficult airway. Now, cleft lip palate per se does not make airway obstruction inevitable. But and when it occurs, it's often associated with other structural and neuromuscular problems. There are well-defined syndromes which have already been defined in the previous presentation that may be, can be associated with a difficult intubation. But remember that non-syndromic patients can also have a difficult airway. In this study published in 2011, it was illustrated that patients of cleft lip and palate that are non-syndromic but have retrognathia, large and bilateral cleft are the ones who are associated with a higher incidence of difficult airway. Also, if they've had a previous surgery for lip or palate and present to you for a repeat surgery, they're likely to have a difficult airway. Another problem which comes under the difficult airway category in these patients is that you're sharing the airway with the surgeon. And all of you who've done this and managed surgeons, ENT or plastic or pediatric surgeons dealing with the airway know that irrespective of how good the surgeon is, it is an opportunity for inadvertent tube occlusion or extubation at any stage of the procedure. Actually, the mask ventilation, you know, difficult airway is a very broad and general term. What in the airway can be difficult? To answer this question, the slide before you tells you that mask ventilation is the be difficult in these patients. If you just see the picture on the right hand side, if the child has a large cleft like this, mask ventilation is bound to be difficult. There are going to be leaks around the mask and it's not going to be the same as in a normal child. In this study published many, many years back, but still relevant, it has been shown that laryngoscopy is also difficult in these children. The incidence of difficult laryngoscopy in non-syndrome lip and palate is almost 5 to 7%, which is much higher than the incidence of difficult laryngoscopy seen in pediatric population. The presence of a large or bilateral alveolar defect causes the laryngoscope to fall into the cleft. Also, the difficult laryngoscopy is caused by malaligned teeth and the presence of malformed maxilla. Intubation, however, in these patients is not classically difficult. The mask ventilation is, laryngoscopy is, but if you manage these two paths, then the intubation per se is not very difficult. Also in the category of difficult airway, I would like to emphasize that there are problems with the placement of the endotracheal tube. There is a potential of tube shift with the positioning. There is a potential for tube occlusion. And there is a potential when you tie the endotracheal tube, the lip gets distorted and the surgeon will not like this. Third problem, major problem, is the evidence of chronic airway obstruction in children who have cleft lip and palate, particularly palate. If there is evidence of snoring, if there is history of apnea during feeds or protracted feeding times, remember that this can indicate chronic airway obstruction. And these children, particularly older children and sometimes adults who come to you for surgery, may have evidence of chronic hypoxia, which eventually will lead to some form of right ventricular hypertrophy and evidence of core pulmonale. What is the relevance for you as an anesthesiologist? If there is evidence of snoring or history of uh, apnea during feeds, these patients might have right ventricular hypertrophy and involvement of the right heart. So these patients must be evaluated with an ECG and a preoperative echo needs to be done. Obviously, with evidence of chronic hypoxia, remember that these patients will remain more sensitive to sedative drugs that you use. They have a higher incidence of airway obstruction, both at induction of anesthesia and in the postoperative period, and have a higher level of postoperative monitoring requirement. These patients are more prone to anemia. Dr. Poonam has told you how sucking and uh, uh, the, the consumption of feeds is defective. These patients do not have adequate weight gain. So these nutritional reasons are responsible for the patients developing anemia as well as a deficiency of proteins. Speech, hearing, learning is all hindered because of the abnormal uh, cleft palate uh, musculature, which means that communication with these children will be a problem. During surgery, there is a potential of damage to the eyes. 
They need to be covered well. We'll come to this as we progress through the presentation. Also, the surgeons will infiltrate local anesthetic with a vasoconstrictor in large amounts to make their field less vascular. Remember that you need to keep a track of the maximum doses and of the uh, maximum uh, doses of even epinephrine because it is going to have significant cardiovascular effects. Blood loss in this surgery is a problem and palatal surgery is an extremely painful procedure, which means that there is an enhanced need for analgesics during this procedure. Of course, other congenital anomalies is another set of problems. These have been highlighted well. Remember that a high rate of suspicion should be patients having cleft lip and palate. Uh, involvement of the heart in the form of uh, uh, tetralogy of fallow and AST or VST is quite common in these patients. And those who have associated craniofacial abnormalities will have a higher instance of difficult airway. So if you find any of these associated conditions, remember these patients require a thorough workup of the underlying problem. Now let's come to the preoperative assessment. As in any child, a detailed history related to the birth, the milestones, the growth, as we've highlighted the presence of URI, any previous surgery, any problems in the siblings other than that child, all need to be elucidated. A detailed physical examination should be done which includes a general physical examination and a focused airway assessment. Remember to look out for retrognathia, which can be seen if you see the side child in the side profile. This must be done for every child, whether the child is syndromic, has a plain lip or a plain palate involvement. What preoperative investigations should you do? For lip, nothing much is required except probably a hemogram. For a palate, an uncomplicated palate, again, as in any other child, a hemogram and a blood grouping in cross-matching might suffice. But those children who are syndromic, who have multiple problems, their basic underlying problem will decide which kind of investigations should be done. We can't go into the details of all this because time is uh, uh, will run short. Of course, consent needs to be taken and the child must be fasted as per standard guidelines. Uh, we not also go into the details, but for those residents who are interested in pursuing this further, there is a very beautiful write-up in 2022 regarding preoperative fasting guidelines in children. Remember that fasting guidelines have changed, but these patients are high-risk patients. They have a so-called difficult airway and preoperative fasting guidelines must be adhered to because you can run into a difficult airway anytime during the induction of anesthesia. Uh, should you give them pre-medication? Most of the children who come for cleft lip at around three months of age do not require pre-medication because separation anxiety has not yet set in. But for cleft palate, children are slightly older. These are the children who have URI. These are the children who are apprehensive on separation from the parents. And if they continuously cry before coming to the theater, you're going to deal with increased secretions. That's going to create a problem. So these are the category of kids who do need uh, uh, pre-medication, oral midazolam in the dose of 0.5 milligram per kg or dexmedetomidine delivered orally or intranasally in the dose of one to two microgram per kg are good alternatives. But remember that if the patient has an associated airway anomaly, these sedatives can precipitate airway obstruction and may be avoided or very guarded call on a case-to-case -case basis should be taken before prescribing sedative pre-medication in children with a difficult airway. Many surgeons like this field to be dry and anti in the form of glycopyrrolate can be given at the time of induction because of the airway manipulation and blood both in the gastrointestinal tract and probably some part of the airway, these patients are more prone to develop post-operative nausea vomiting and ondansetron can be given after induction for taking care of this POND. Now, obviously these children all require general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation and controlled ventilation. It is very common to do inhalational induction uh, with a volatile anesthetic agent delivered in oxygen and nitrous oxide as per the need of the child. If the child does not have an IV access in situ, it can be established after induction has taken place through the inhalational route. 
But if the child does not have any other problem, you are not anticipating a difficult airway. It is a, a, it is a lip or a palate which is uncomplicated. A standard IV induction is appropriate with the routine drugs delivered in routine pediatric doses. Do not forget to give opioids. This can include fentanyl in a dose of two microgram per kg with thiopentone or propofol, which you have given for induction. For complicated cases, large palates, those cases which are going to take a lot of time and involve a lot of surgical manipulation, morphine in the dose of 0.1 milligram per kg is an appropriate drug to give. However, I would like to re-emphasize that with the use of drugs like morphine, post-operative monitoring and uh, of the child should be in place. Mask ventilation must be ensured after inhalational or IV induction of anesthesia. And once you ensure that mask ventilation can take place, you can go ahead with muscle relaxation with a non-depolarizing agent. Use of scoline is no longer recommended in standard anesthesia practice in pediatrics unless you are anticipating a really difficult airway. So go ahead with induction followed by mask ventilation and muscle relaxation so that you can do an uninterrupted and smooth laryngoscopy and intubation. As I've already highlighted, when you do a laryngoscopy, the laryngoscope can fall into the cleft. But if you pack that cleft with a rolled gauze piece, it will take care of this problem. Laryngoscopy is usually followed by an oral intubation. Nasal intubation is not preferred, particularly if the patient is coming to you for a palate surgery or for a repeat surgery, do not need to do a nasal intubation to disrupt the previous surgical repair. The types of tubes which are recommended for use in this kind of procedure include preformed tubes such as the Oxford tube, which is not any longer used, and the RAE tube, south pole facing. This has a bend. This endotracheal tube with the bend that reaches the chin is very easy to fix and provides a good surgical exposure to the surgeon. A flexometallic tube can also be used, and for uncomplicated cleft lip surgery, we can also go ahead with the standard microcuff endotracheal tubes. The endotracheal tube, when fixed, should not alter the facial symmetry. What I would also like to highlight now is that with increasing availability of video laryngoscopes, they are being used in cleft lip and palate surgery. They've actually made life not only simple, but safer because it helps you do intubation well and uncomplicated with less complications in uh, children who have a syndrome and anticipated difficult airway. Use of supraglottic device is another revolution in airway management in children with difficult airway. They've really made things very simple and very safe. They can be used as a primary device for management of the airway in the anticipated difficult airway scenario. You can go ahead with fiber optic intubation through the supraglottic device. You can also these use these device for primary oxygenation, which means that immediately after induction, if you are not able to do mask ventilation, you can just insert the device and do oxygenation with the device. And of course, you can use it as a rescue device uh, if uh, your laryngoscopy is, uh, is, has failed. Uh, we need to be careful about removal of the supraglottic device after you have achieved intubation through the device, and this can only be learned through practice. There is immense amount of literature that is available. You just have to Google this. Uh, the use of supraglottic devices in children with anticipated and difficult airways or even with unanticipated difficult airways. Uh, there is a lot of literature available and those who wish to go into it can uh, use these references for further uh, study. Now, after you've done an intubation, you need to pack the throat. This helps to absorb the blood and secretions, but remember the throat pack, uh, remember to mark somewhere that you've put a throat pack, put a flag or a label on the patient's forehead saying that the throat pack is in situ so that you do not forget to remove it. The patient needs to be positioned for a cleft palate surgery, which involves use of a head ring and extensive rolls under the shoulders to severely extend the neck. Many, patients, many surgeons like a lot of neck extension. And remember that once you do this, you need to have the head and neck well fixed. Also remember that this kind of acute positioning can bring your endotracheal tube out. Even accidental extubation has been reported. So be very, very vigilant when patient positioning is taking place. 
After you've done your patient positioning, many a times an extension line would need to be put in on the patient so that drug delivery is not hindered once the patient has been covered in drapes and handed over to the surgeon. Be careful of how you place the breathing circuit and where you place your workstation. For this, an active communication with the surgical team is recommended. Many a times your workstation will be placed at the foot end. You need extensions in the circuits and you need to be very careful about your placements. Must communicate with the surgeon regarding this. All throughout the surgical procedure, as you had started with induction, this basic monitoring should continue. These are a few pictures which show you how the tube needs to be fixed. It has to be fixed on the lower lip and it has to be in the center of the lip so that there is no distortion of the facial anatomy. Uh, during surgery, many a times, the Dingman retractor is placed to improve the surgical visualization. This helps to keep the mouth open and the tongue clear, giving the surgeons a clear and, and ample field to work in. This is what the Dingman retractor looks like. What is important to remember when the retractor is put that it has a potential for compressing the endotracheal tube when it is initially raised. If you can see on the picture that is displayed, the tube which has been pushed to the side has already got compressed. The lumen has got obliterated when the uh, retractor was pushed into place. So at the time of retractor placement, be very, very vigilant. Keep an eye on the compliance of the bag. I uh, may sound old fashioned, but I still have the bag in my hand. I do not put the patient at this time on the closed circuit till the positioning and the, uh, the, the uh, mouth gag has been put because this is a very nice way to tell you that there is some form of obstruction. The airway pressures will rise and the ETCO2, if no ventilation is taking place, will also acutely alter, telling you that there is some form of tube occlusion happening with the Dingman retractor in place. Controlled ventilation is recommended. Spontaneous ventilation, even in very small children, is no longer recommended. Controlled ventilation will allow you to reduce the basic anesthetic requirement of inhalational agents. It allows a rapid wake up and good recovery of reflexes at the end of surgery, and it prevents a rise in PaCO2, which will influence the eventual blood loss. Now, blood loss, as I've already highlighted before, can be a problem in patients undergoing cleft palate surgery. You may need to replace blood. Be very vigilant about the loss, which can get lost in the drapes that are next to the patient's face and away from you. Hypothermia can occur in complicated cases which are going on for long because hypothermia has been shown to be directly proportional to the length of the surgery and to the temperature of the surgical room. Remember, hypothermia in small children is directly responsible for increasing the amount of blood loss that happens during surgery. Postoperative pain relief is essential. Uh, paracetamol uh, is to be given and a detailed discussion of this will take place in the subsequent talk. Uh, a few pictures to give you a, a fair idea of what, what happens in surgery. As you can see, the eyes are nicely taped uh, and there is a gauze piece. But remember, before you put this gauze piece, do tape the lids before putting the gauze piece because under the drapes, the simple gauze piece will cause corneal irritation. So tape the eyelids, then put a gauze piece and then seal the area because you can see that the betadine has already soiled the eye uh, area and this can get into the eyes if you don't close them properly. This is throat pack, which is taking place after intubation and uh, uh, after uh, the, the, before the surgery, its child is handed over for surgery. And this is the positioning, as I've said, uh, there is acute extension and the child's neck and shoulders need to be well balanced and should be, uh, the head should not be rolling around. As you can see, this is the, uh, after the draping, the surgeon is taking uh, measurements with the vernier calipers and here on the right hand side he's in, inserting injecting large amounts of local anesthetic with adrenaline on the completion of surgery remember to inspect the oropharynx well remove the throat pack remove any blood clots please assess the hemostasis and do this under a deep plane 
Do not stop the anesthetic delivery before you've done a very, very thorough examination of the oropharynx under vision with laryngoscopy and a very, very gentle application of suction because otherwise it will disrupt the suture line. Extubate the patient's trachea only when you have assessed that there is no bleeding, the child is fully awake and the protective airway reflexes have returned. These patients have had an airway surgery, they have high incidence of URI, they have blood and secretions in the airway and are very, very prone to develop laryngospasm and bronchospasm. In one case report uh, article, the incidence of laryngospasm is as high as 70% at the end of surgery in these patients. Be very vigilant for this problem to occur. Signs of airway obstruction must be looked for. This is the most common problem that can occur in the post-operative period probably seen in infants with one pre-existing airway problems. Why the incidence is so high is because the surgery itself is going to cause this problem. By the surgery, you have narrowed the upper airway space and that itself is going to cause obstruction. Incidence of laryngospasm, the presence of blood clots, retained throat packs, the presence of tongue swelling due to prolonged retraction or inadequate mouth breathing are some of the causes which can cause airway obstruction in these children. When this occurs, remember, you can gently put in a nasopharyngeal airway or turn the patient lateral. Do not put in an oropharyngeal airway because it disrupts the surgical repair. Very, very rarely, reintubation may be required. For postoperative care, remember that some amount of sedation is required. You need to balance this very carefully. On one side, we are saying that you extubate the child when he's fully awake with return of airway reflexes. On the other side, I'm saying that some amount of sedation is required because you don't want a thrashing, agitated child in the post-op who's going to tug at the sutures and cause disruption of the surgical repair. So some amount of sedation might need to be given to these children with very careful monitoring in the PAKU for airway obstruction and evidence of bleeding. Steroids are often given in the form of dexamethasone for the first 24 hours. In many centers, a tongue stitch may also be placed by the surgeon to prevent obstruction. This is usually kept in the paku, and when the child is shifted to the ward or to the floor, the tongue stitch may be re re removed before the child is being shifted. Many children are reluctant to feed, and IV fluids may be continued until oral intake is established. And of course, there is no replacement for good postoperative analgesia. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anju. Uh, very thorough coverage of the anesthetic concerns and uh, how you deal with that. Excellent. I think there's hardly anything that you have not touched upon. Uh, but uh, as the policy is, uh, we will have uh, the discussion at the end of the next presentation. Thanks. And uh, friends, I would also like to say that those who have any queries uh, that's coming up in their minds, they can put it in the chat box so that we can address these uh, we can direct these queries to the speakers and you know they can give their expert opinion on that thank you so much uh, Dr. Yes. once again and uh, friends now we uh, go on to uh, the one area which dr anju singh uh, was uh, you know touching a bit and then she said okay, okay the next speaker will uh, do full justice to this and that is pain management uh, for cleft surgery well, uh, you know, uh, pain management, as you all know, particularly in pediatric age group, is very difficult to measure in adults. Of course, you can have various kind of scales, uh, whereas in pediatric age group, it's much more difficult to, uh, to measure and, of course, uh, to take care of that pain. Uh, here is Dr. Ekta Gupta. She would be uh, speaking on the pain management for cleft surgery. Dr. Ekta Gupta, can you, uh, kindly uh, share uh, your screen? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Anjusen, uh, yeah, that's right. Please share your screen. Can you see the share? Uh, uh, I can see. You. Yes, I can now see the uh, yeah. screen. And uh, Dr. Ekta Gupta is, uh, you know, working in Chachanaru Bal Chikitsalya, which is a premier institution, institution uh, uh, in Delhi. And she's uh, thoroughly devoted to pediatric analysis for a large, uh, you know, for, for, a, for a long period of time. Uh, this is a, a, an exclusive government pediatric hospital and uh, so far as I remember is the first ever government uh, hospital which was NABH accredited and that was many years back. I think it was about 13-14 uh, years back. So 
Uh, she is also certified uh, uh, PPLS instructor uh, on behalf of Indian Association for Pediatric Anesthesiologists, uh, anesthesiologists and uh, she has publication in national as well as international journals and participated in various national and international conferences as faculty. And uh, apart from that, uh, she is working as a quality manager and NEBS coordinator at uh, Hara Hospital. And uh, she also goes for NEBH accreditation uh, for uh, to, to other hospitals also. Her field of interest, of course, is pediatric anesthesia. She is a devoted uh, pediatric anesthetist and, of course, quality uh, control as well. Uh, besides her uh, academic, uh, you know, qualifications uh, of MD, she's also, uh, uh, you know, she has some degree in, in quality uh, assurance as well. Uh, Postgraduate diploma in hospital management as well. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ekta Gupta. Thank you, sir, uh, for the nice welcome. At the outset, I would like to thank the ICA team for inviting me for this lecture on pain management for cleft lip and palate surgery, which is in a very important area uh, for success of anesthesia and surgery. The aim of the anesthetist at the post-operative period is smooth extubation with normothermic child, comfortable quiet child with minimal post-operative emergence symptom and adequate pain control. And I think everybody will well uh, agree that seeing a uh, very calm and comfortable child like this and the smiling parents always makes our day. So coming to the pain, pain is a fifth vital sign. We all know that. That's why Declaration of Montreal has said that access to pain is, uh, the, is a fundamental right. So that's why there have been incorporation of pain assessment into many charts in normal nursing routines in the education programs and in our modified LRED score. But there is a, this pain in post-procedural and surgery has been inadequately controlled at many centers. Uh, so what is the properties of the perfect pain therapy? We all want that it should be easily available, it should be safe, it do not require complex monitoring, and it should be effective for quite a long time, that like four to six hours kind of thing. So what are the elements of pain assessment? After knowing the pain, we should know how to assess the pain. Uh, these are the four things like assessing the physiological parameters, performing the behavioral observation. We can question the child or the mo mother and parents and using the standardized assessment tool. Coming to the physiological responses, these responses become very important for such children like cleft lip and palate surgery. Those who are like six months, three months old, in that you will see that they develop the CVS respiratory symptoms like increase in heart rate, there is variation in BP. They may have increased heart respiratory rate or decreased respiratory rate. They can be also impaired respiratory uh, function. They can be poor appetite and it also leads to decreased wound healing. And sometimes in neurological cases, if you have the decreased pain, increased pain, then there can be increased intracranial pressure. So we should be always look on these physiological parameters and respond accordingly. Coming to the behavioral clues, like child can be inconsolably crying. They can be grimacing. These are very common uh, features in children, like three months old, six months old, those who cannot actually speak and who cannot you know, uh, express, they cannot tell their parents that what is happening to them. So they can be, uh, body movements can be uh, hypertonicity, hypotonicity. These are very common features in the post-operative period or on the, uh, on the table, and they can be changes in sleep and wake cycle. Coming to this pain rating scale, we have a lot of pain rating scales available like numeric pain scale, descriptive scales, visual analog score, and the flag pain score. This is one of the, this is very common. Everybody knows about this visual analog score where uh, you can show the face chart or you can show the number and the pain more than four or more than eight, like more than four is coming into the moderate category and more than seven to eight is more than the severe category. And uh, the child, especially the uh, more than one year or more than 
uh, two years, they are not able to say, but if they are into coming into the preschool or the toddler age group, then they can definitely tell about these groups if they are pre previously taught about it. Coming to the flag score, which is a very important score for children from two months to seven years of age, we just have to observe them for a while and see their face, their legs activity, their cry and their consolability. So the again, the score is taken from zero to 10, like four to six is a moderate pain and seven to 10 is a severe pain. So normally in the, uh, if they have like one or two category, it means they are going to the moderate to severe pain. They will be uneasy. They will be kicking their legs. They will try to reach to the uh, dressings then they might, uh, hypertonicity will be there. They will be shifting here and there, arch, jerking, moaning, you know, that's very important. They're just moaning. You just give them so many things. Then uh, like you give them sugar, you let them be with their mothers, but they're inconsolable. They cannot uh, be quiet. And so it means it shows that these kids are very much in pain. So what intervention we can have for these kind of, after the assessment, what intervention we can have? We can have the non-pharmacological methods or we can have the pharmacological methods. Like non-pharmacological methods is a very easy and a very good method for especially the kids as compared to the adults. Like in infants, you can just pat them, touch them, just see it, you know? Like if you just suck them, give them a pacifier, Sometimes if you give them just 24, you, you give them glucose or you just give them a quiet environment, they will definitely show the very nice effect. And coming to the toddlers and preschoolers, even though like cleft palate and surgeries is being done in one and a half years till the one and a half, but still we get many kids with uh, uh, who delayed uh, a presentation, they might come. So then they can be given some small mobile or they can be given some small plays, vans, bubbles. You, you can just praise them. You know, you can prepare them pre-operatively and the caregiver presence is really helpful as they are, may develop, start developing the stranger anxiety. Now what all pain modalities like pharmacological ma management we have. We have local anesthetic infiltration by surgeon, non-opioid analgesic, opioid analgesic, some of the other drugs, alpha-2 agonists like dexmedimidine, which is still in trial and nerve blocks. But always remember that multimodal approach is the best approach. Until unless you are doing a research, but always follow the multimodal approach, give a sufficient different kind of analgesia. You can use acetaminophen, you can give opioids in the perioperative period, intraoperative period. Dr. Anju has already stressed upon the importance of intraoperative and perioperative opioids. Then regional anesthesia is there. But always remember, all these techniques are complementary. There is no, no, comp, no technique is an alternative above another technique. So use multiple analgesics, multiple techniques. This will decrease the dose of one technique and adverse effect. Coming to the infiltration, it's a very old school of thought that infiltration, the surgeon used to do it when we didn't have blocks, we didn't have uh, different kind of good drugs, but still, you know, this infiltration of surgical field with local anesthetic and epinephrine is still followed by the oral surgeons because uh, like especially in the cleft palate surgery, pre-incisional infiltration with LA with epinephrine, they are doing uh, for decreasing the bleeding, but it works as a local anesthetic also, but not in the lip surgery because it distorts the margin. And in the post-operatively also, we can tell them to infiltrate, especially in the cases of cleft palate because lip, lip they don't want to again distort the margins. But still these method, this method is, uh, is not very satisfactory, but it just complement the other method. Coming to the opioid analgesic, intraoperatively, yes, this is the best thing we have. Perioperatively, we, we have to be very careful about uh, uh, the, using them, especially in the cases of children, those who uh, have multiple congenital anomalies, so we should be very careful about using them. 
and if you don't have a good tattoo so opioid the advantages is smoother emergence they cry less there is a as there is a smoother emergence it reduces the trauma to the airway and decreases the risk of post operative bleeding but what are the side effect we do have side effect with this that is sedation nausea myosis and in pruritus in some cases so it should be used i have already told you that it should be used for intraoperative and early post operative period we have iv fentanyl which is very effective drug short acting which is the best drug for the small kids morphine again this is a long acting drug so it has to be very carefully given then we have pethidine oral codeine is there always remember if you are using this opioid in the perioperative period or intraoperative period also you should always have naloxone in hand so uh, these is the doses of fentanyl 1 microgram we can give after post operatively we can start with 0.5 microgram per kg in the graded doses and morphine 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg and codeine per orally like uh, we can have 1.5 mg per kg fix early coming to the acetaminophen which comes into the non opioid group it's a very important most frequently to uh, used drug it has got uh, it's a excellent safety profile and we all know it inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis it doesn't have much anti inflammatory effect but it the advantage is, is that it doesn't causes gastritis platelet dysfunction doesn't causes and it can be used from any age group it doesn't have any restrictions for more less than 6 months more than 6 months but remember that hepatotoxicity is also one of the major concern when it is used in higher doses we have it can be given in all sorts of routes like rectal oral iv whatever you are use uh, comfortable and whatever it is available with you like oral it is given in the doses of 10 to 15 mg per kg every 6 hourly and for the iv it is uh, 7.5 mg per kg to 5, 15 mg per kg coming to the nsaids non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs again we have this has got all sorts of routes like rectal oral iv then uh, ibuprofen diclofenac naproxen and ketorlec is being commonly used in this group and uh, we should be using them as 6 hourly to 8 hourly in our practice coming to the breakthrough pain like if even if we are not able to control our children with the all the blocks or in the infiltration and the acetaminophen we have uh, fentanyl morphine tramadol and ketamine for breakthrough pain like in between we can try them but under the constant supervision and always titrating to our effect remember this uh, who analgesic ladder that uh, if you have very mild pain if the child is quite comfortable then you can continue with acetaminophen orally initially iv and then orally at the start taking orally in the moderate to severe pain we should uh, think of opioids plus non opioids and as the pain increases we have to think about it so coming to the blocks like uh, this is i want to talk about uh, a brief anatomy of the uh, maxillary division the trigeminal nerve this is one is uh, the trigeminal ganglion the second is the uh, the trigeminal ganglion the trigeminal nerve is dividing into two divisions like this is the ophthalmic second is the ophthalmic division third is the maxillary division then this second uh the ophthalmic division is continuing up to the uh, as external nasal uh, nerve which supplies the tip of the nose so if the uh, tip of the nose is involved in the uh, complete cleft lip then you have to use this block to uh, uh, to uh, give the nasal area the uh, pain free and for coming to the third uh, you can see that it divide continues as infraorbital nerve that is the A fourth one is the intraorbital nerve, and then it is further dividing into greater palatine and lesser palatine nerve. This uh, intraorbital nerve supplies the upper lip. I'll. Uh, this is what the intraorbital nerve will be supplying the upper lip, and much of the skin of the face between upper lip and the lower eyelid. External nasal nerve I have talked about. It is supplying to the ala nasi and the tip of the nose. 
then coming to the uh, greater palatine lesser palatine and naso palatine nerve the lesser palatine is supplying to soft palate tonsil and uvula greater palatine is supplying to the hard palate and the naso palatine is supplying the up uh, the front structure of the palate that is upper central and lateral incisor and canines so after knowing the anatomy one should be aware of what know what is the block how is which block is given the infraorbital nerve can be given bilateral or unilateral according to the disease if the lip is unilateral like right or left then we should give the unilateral block but in many of the cases it is bilateral uh, cleft lip then we have to give the both sided the infraorbital block block so uh, one should know about the in uh, io foramen infraorbital foramen so uh, the like the infraorbital nerve it leaves it uh, the skull from the foramen retentum it enters the pal uh, terego palatine fossa then it enters into the uh, infraorbital foramen which is the main landmark for this uh, block and from there it emerges in the caudate and medial direction before dividing into four branches which is our main area of concern so main indication of infraorbital nerve block is mainly the surgery of the lower eyelid the upper lip that is cleft lip the median cheek endoscopic sinus surgery and rhinoplasty now there are two approaches to the block that is extraoral and intraoral uh, intraoral means the dental region normally the dentists are using it but still it's a very good uh, approach like you after folding the upper lip you can use mainly the 25 to 27 gauge hypodermic needle try to use 27 gauge hypodermic needle insert through buccal mucosa at the level of canine or first premolar and direct the needle towards the infraorbital foramen always place your finger at the io foramen or lower uh, orbital margin or lower eyelid so that you are you can palpate the progress of the needle avoiding unnecessary passage into the opet as i already told you io foramen uh, landmark should be known to everyone it is a uh, average distance from the midline is 21.3 plus 0.5 into age uh, that is in millimeter or you can just think of that uh, it is just below the orbital rim at the intersection of a vertical line you draw a line from the center of the pupil and a horizontal line through the ali nazai it is at the intersection of that point you can see in this picture that uh, this is a supraorbital foramen this is a infraorbital foramen this is a mental foramen here i can see that this a line divide at the center of the pupil and a line dividing the, from the ali nazai the intersection point is the io foramen this is a picture showing that as you reaches the io foramen this is approach intraoral approach i'm talking about as you reaches there you aspirate and give 0.5 to 1 ml of 0.25% bupivacain you can use uh, low, uh, you can add uh, adrenaline because it will increase the uh, duration of analgesia there have been reports that it has been effective for as long as 18 to 19 hours also so extraoral approach normally the anesthetists are more uh, you know they want to do this kind of but both the approaches are good like infraorbital approach the extra uh, oral approach in that you have to for, again same the you have to palpate the io foramen then uh, use the 25 to 27 gauge needle the hypodermic needle advance perpendicularly with the cephalic and medial direction towards the foramen until you feel the bony resistance because the axis of the infraorbital foramen is oriented caudally and medially a lateral to medial approach reduces the risk of penetration of foramen after again the same method as we have a caution for any kind of block you have to aspirate give 0.5 to 1 ml of 0.25 bupivacain again i stress upon that you can add any of the adjuvant like uh, epinephrine or other adjuvant which you feel like and pressure should be applied to io area to retain the solution and preventing dissection into the periorbital area this is a picture and uh, it is showing the like how the needle it can be uh, taken like this lateral to medial or you can just insert 
perpendicular also into the direction of the orbit. So coming to the complications associated with the block, everything comes with a complication, but they are quite mild, like loose tissue of the face can, they can be, uh, can uh, develop the ecchymosis and swelling. If you are uh, very uh, cautious, then there will be no injury, but there have been reports of injury to eye orbit, there, uh, any local block, you know, there is a intravascular injection can be there. So always you should be incremental doses, even though here is it's only 0.5 ml to 1 ml, but you should be very slow in your doses and frequent aspiration should be done. And there can be persistent paresthesias of the upper lip. So, and uh, once there is an orbital injection of anesthetic solution, it can lead to diplopia, exophthalmos and blindness. The advantages of this block is that it causes superior post-operative analgesia, it lowers the post-operative paracetamol doses, the lower the pain score, and like we don't need the first rescue analgesia, IV or oral, and it causes a better surgical out outcome as a child is very calm, it is not agitated, and it will not be pulling on his dressing. And the, uh, the hastens of the surgical procedure would be prevented. Coming to the blocks for cleft palate, uh, mainly the greater palatine block, lesser palatine, and the nasopalatine block are used for the different kind of palate surgery. Greater palatine nerve block. Greater palatine nerve block is localized at one centimeter medial to the junction of second and third molar. So you have to identify that greater palatine foramen. Uh, you can see here that one is the greater palatine uh, foramen. Here it is given the greater palatine nerve block. This is a second is a position of lesser palatine foramen and third is the nasopalatine uh, foramen. So for the greater palatine nerve block, you have to localize this foramen first. Needle is directed to the mouth from the opposite side at a right angle to, the de or to deposit the local anesthetic anesthetic. It provides anesthesia to palatal mucosa and the heart palate from the first premolar anteriorly to the posterior aspect of the heart palate and to midline medially. So always, you know, you must take action. The only reason to assess the pain is to take action to relieve pain. Once you have given some uh, a block or any other thing you have given after your intervention, you should assess the child response to pain relief. You should always just wait for a while so that your response comes. Then always you should be knowing what is the expected onset and peak effect of intervention. And again, if the child is not uh, pain-free, then we can have think of other pain management. The take-home message for this uh, is that the optimal pain management is the right of all patients and the responsibility of all health professionals. The golden rule, always remember that what is painful to an adult is painful to an infant and child unless proven otherwise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ekta. I like the last slide uh, very uh, succinctly. It uh, conveys a message that Whatever is painful to adult is painful for the child as well. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a message we must carry back home and uh, must uh, keep it in our minds. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, friends. Uh, all three uh, speakers have done a wonderful job with their, uh, 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 with their topics. And uh, now the topic, uh, all the three topics are open for discussion. If there are any queries, let me see in the chat box if I can see there. Uh, Sir, as of now, we can't see anything in the chat box, I think. Yeah, I think they were all mesmerized by the presentations uh, that you made, uh, all three of you. And uh, uh, till, till some queries come, uh, can I uh, yes, sir, please. have the privilege? Uh, yes, sir, please. Well, uh, Dr. Anju uh, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, you mentioned about the uh, children who have a runny nose, a chronic rhinorrhea, and uh, you said that you know four weeks uh, uh, should be should be given. Now, if a child has a running nose, it may be because of the crying that the child is uh, having the running nose. Uh, 
in that case uh, do you still uh, support the view that yes for four weeks we um, have to wait sir that is the reason i had outlined those criteria <coughs> which actually define those patients at risk every child who has a runny nose because they have chronic rhinorrhea and as you very rightly pointed out may come to the ot with with a runny nose because, just because he's crying so no those cases i will not refuse it is only those cases who are obviously sick you know that means they're having a very congested nose you can see encrustations close to the nostril the child is probably running fever has got copious secretions the chest is bad uh, the sputum has a color which is other than uh, the the normal color and the mother says the child is not looking well is looking sick those cases i won't but yes mild uri a febrile child just a runny nose i would definitely accept that well i i i get your message uh, basically uh, i think mother is a very strong informer yes. here uh, yes, you know and uh, if you, if you ask her uh, correctly uh, i'm sure she would give a lot of information which may be yes, of uh, relevance sir, and a lot of significance uh, mother batayegi sir ke bachcha ab theek hai ke nahi hai ki hamesha hi aise rehta hai exactly anak to doctor sahab hamesha hi behta rehta hai you yeah. sick little amount of rhinorrhea will stay uh, hmm. so unless the child but yes if the child is sick i feel then there is no harm in because this is an oral surgery sir all the risk factors all those boxes you will end up ticking uh, for the cleft palate surgery it's an airway surgery you require endotracheal intubation uh, the the risk of infection is much higher and can there is no need for you to rush into this surgery because it's an elective surgery so if you uh, identify those red flags then probably you should postpone the surgery for a couple of weeks very true uh i think uh, even the literature also suggests that in case the child has some constitutional symptoms yes sir. apart from the running nose whether yes. the child is having cough or he has he has fever has yes, a sir. higher respiratory rate than normal uh, again uh, mother will be a very yes, strong uh, you know information provider so in that case it's always better to wait for 3 to 4 weeks because yes, uh, the inflammatory changes which have occurred uh, will take a yes. long time yes. much yes. longer time than the fever has uh, disappeared right. so uh, i've seen uh, dr anjan singh uh, some of the surgeons they are very keen to rush through their uh, patients so sir meri to waiting list bahut lambi hai mai kya karu to so it has to be so they will give antibiotic for two or three days or four yes, days sir. child becomes a febrile or remains a febrile for two three days and then you know he is tempted to uh, take the patient to the ot i think i i i i i absolutely agree sir but then even a surgeon sir who's been operating repeatedly he is the one who's going to end up facing these problems in the post op yeah. you'll have a sick child you'll have a pyrexial illness you'll have a, a, a poor wound healing and he may do it once he may do it twice but i'm sure uh, uh, your surgeon will also listen to you after a point of time because it's in the benefit of the surgeon and the patient both that the child be well at the time when he's operating very true well uh, another issue that uh, we often come across uh, in our children i mean the indian population or uh, population from the asian countries is that uh, you know the children are quite anemic often uh, they are anemic see uh, 10 grams uh, you know you give a smile to the child when you see a report 10 <laughs> grams good patient is ready ready for the ot uh, but sir, uh, I, quite yeah. often it is 8 grams 8.5 or maybe 9 or something and uh, i've seen some of the surgeons try to push through again ke yes, sir isko blood de dete hain kal subah tak iska dash ho jayega fir le lenge so what's the point in that ha fir le lenge so there are uh, uh, c1 uh, let me begin by saying that the guidelines to perioperative transfusions have undergone a paradigm shift you know we are no longer hankering upon the 10 g percent even in neonates who are healthy like this cleft lip palate child probably at 3 months which is otherwise completely healthy nobody is insisting on 10 g as a, as a parameter but yes for patients who already have a low hemoglobin you may accept them they are it is acceptable but they have no margin for uh, allowable blood loss yeah. so otherwise if you have a 9 9.5 9.8 10 10.2 10 you have a certain margin which allows you to uh, tolerate certain amount of blood loss but if you are accepting a child with 7 grams you can 
there is no allowable blood loss margin, then you will have to give that Nile blood, which has its own set of complications perioperatively. So uh, uh, you may not insist on 10, but a child who's obviously pale, uh, who's malnourished, should be probably encouraged to increase the hemoglobin before you take him up for a palate surgery, uh, particularly a complicated surgery. There is no rush to that surgery because you are anticipating blood loss. I would accept for a lip, there's hardly any blood loss in lip. The duration of surgery is short. Uh, there is no anesthetic management uh, complication, which you are generally anticipating, but palate surgeries, which are longer with large amounts of loss, I would recommend that hemoglobin be taken up to an acceptable level before you accept them and don't let the surgeon push you. Well, uh, I think it's very important that you must stand your ground. A, something this is not to be done and simple you see surgeons are tempted ke blood dete hain to you know 9.5 ho gaya ji 9.8 ho gaya aapko nice so nice. a, this should be uh, discouraged because uh, if the blood is given to the child on the, the day before uh, we all understand that you know it will increase the viscosity as well as it will increase circulatory volume also the patient is more likely to have problems yes, in the post period so i think it will come on to us eventually in case uh, the child yes, becomes yes, serious in the yes. post period period uh, i would like to give you a break for a while uh, dr ekta you know the, some uh, centers they give intramuscular ketamine before they wheel the patient in not necessarily for analgesia but, uh, you know, they think that, uh, you know, the child remains sedated, child remains cool, child, uh, you know, can allow uh, easy uh, insertion of IV line. What's your, uh, you know, take on that? Sir, uh, ketamine uh, was actually used previously, but now uh, as you uh, make the child preoperatively, you are just use, uh, talking to them, you are making them calm then uh, there is no need to just because you are wheeling in at that time also you need to be cautious because they can have congenital anomalies associated with this they can have problem they can have difficult intubation so it's preferably uh, if you are giving them it intramuscular ketamine then use it in the preoperative period but still we have oral medazolam ranegal <laughs> medazolam it's a preferable route but rather than in at the time of wheeling these medications should not be used. Okay, all right. And uh, one of the very, very, very common problem uh, in pediatric age group is uh, the setting up of intravenous line. Now, yes. uh, well, you have been doing pediatric analysis for a large, uh, for, a, for a number of years. And uh, how, are, how do you manage this? I mean, do you anesthetize these patients with an inhalational agent? and then you take on IV line or, you know, you can hold the child, just put the line in, or you have some devices, like there are some various devices which are vein finder, or there is some infrared light which you, you know, put in, in the palm of the child and then you can see through uh, that and that, that helps you to identify the way. What's, what's your experience uh, at, at your side? Uh, uh, mainly like uh, for a brief period, for a brief period, we had Embla cream. So we used that, that also. But uh, nowadays, mainly if they have IV, then previous by from the ward, then we are inducing by that. But uh, no, most of the period, we are just uh, anesthetizing them, like we are using oxygen and sevoflurane. And uh, within just five, six breaths, the child is knocked down, it's calm. And uh, we can check the airway at that time only. And we give the, we can put the IV line just using the oxygen and sevoflurane. So I think that that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good practice because the child is asleep well. Uh, yes, it's it's, it's anesthetized and uh, you can do it peacefully. Otherwise, with the child moving around, crying and howling, uh, you know, the, the, the pulling the arm, pulling the, yeah. the, the you know, uh, moving the legs, it becomes very difficult to uh, set up an IV line in. Uh, and so we, uh, yes, so we had uh, done a study on the oral medazolam if it is given as uh, intranasal medazolam 0.5 milligram. So, uh, and it's an easy cannulation, then you take wheel inside the patient, patient is calm, patient can accept the mask and they can also help you put the, they will not move uh, while uh, putting the cannulation. Mm. But definitely the difficult cannulation, you need uh, oxygen and sevoflurane to be knocked down for that. Well, and in, in a device we have, 
true view, but that's not a very good device. I should say that uh, uh, for putting the cannulation, superficial cannulation. So yeah. there are uh, various infrared lights also uh, which are available uh, that you uh, you know put the light on the skin and you can figure out uh, where the veins are. So yes. those are also very helpful. Although I haven't seen uh, many centers using it, but uh, a small light which is put in the palm of the child. And uh, then, you know, uh, you light it up and you see the veins very clearly. Yes. This is uh, what we are using at our center as well. And I've seen many places, uh, you know, uh, who are doing it. So uh, my, my uh, suggestion, you know, for the youngsters here again is that when you are putting up an IV line with the patient under inhalation anesthesia, I think it's a good idea to have two anesthesiologists because one should be looking after the airway alone yeah. because he should not be looking at how the vein is being uh, punctured or what is being done. So another anesthesiologist should be putting up an or an expert should be putting up the IV line because uh, in children, of course, putting an IV line is uh, uh, certainly more uh, difficult. And moreover, in, in a center like yours, where the children, uh, it's not uh, simple children, uh, you know, coming for a clean hernia. You know, at your center, children are coming for much, much uh, longer surgery with much more difficult uh, conditions. So but they already would have had a lot of punctures uh, on, on, on their uh, skin. So that would be making your job uh, pretty difficult. Uh, Dr. Anju Singh, you had mentioned about that, you know, when you position the patient, uh, right, you know, uh, that is a time which is very, very crucial. Yes, uh, you have already mentioned that, you know, there is a possibility of dislodgement of uh, the, even the dislodgement of the tube, it can come out, yes. you know, and the, the various things, the IV lines can be put up. I, I remember one patient I had gone to uh, visit uh, that center. So uh, everything was okay. Line was, uh, you know, tricky. tube was uh, put in, uh, bilateral air and checked. And then the surgeon wanted an extension. So the whole uh, the three, four people, a team of four, five people, they just lifted the child, put a pillow under it. And when they put the child back, you know, the tube came out. So suddenly the saturation started dropping and yes, uh, sir. this crisis moment. So this is one, one moment which is very, very crucial. And I think uh, uh, any alert anesthesiologist would keep a special eye on this because uh, pulling the lines is one thing. Well, and uh, getting the tube out uh, yes, sir. is much more serious. Uh, and I'm Very sure rightly that, uh, said, sir. Uh -huh. At the time of uh, positioning, at the time of when the surgeon is getting ready to take over the patient and at the time when he puts the mouth gag, these are points uh, which you need to be really vigilant and make sure that things are fine. Otherwise, you know, you'll land up in a soup one way or the other. Yeah, very true. And uh, what, do, what is your practice, uh, uh, yours and uh, Dr. Ekta, and of course, uh, um, she should not be left behind, Dr. Puno Motiani. Uh, what's your practice uh, after surgery? Uh, do you put splints? Or, uh, you know, you let the child uh, go as it is without any splint so that the child doesn't scratch his uh, face or pull the uh, dressing. Or... So depending upon the child's age, we either make a boxing glove or we put a splint. Some form to ensure that the line will not be disrupted. In fact, that is the reason I said that some little amount of sedation, you know, we've occasionally had to give patients very small amount of fentanyls when we see them in the PACU before shifting them to the wards because they're agitated. These are the kind of children who have a lot of emergence delirium also. So, you know, a little amount of sedation, then they pull out their lines, they are rubbing their nose, they're rubbing their lip, they're trying to put hands into their mouth because they have this kind of oral irritation and pain after surgery. So some amount of sedation and uh, protection of the IV line is paramount. Now, whether it's a splint or the form of a boxing glove or uh, something like that, that's always done, sir, before shifting the small children out. I think it's very important because uh, <clears throat> both things are bad. Uh, the surgeon is not going to be happy uh, in case the child is uh, fiddling with the, the dressing uh, because the child doesn't know it, yes. even if you are yes. given good pain relief. But still, being given but some pain amount relief of irritation is some, remains, yes. sir. Yes. The yes. child feels something different. You know, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, he is likely to scratch that area. Ki, um, yes, sir. What is, yes, sir. Very uh, right. Over there. And uh, can you believe at one center, apart from, you know, uh, splint is very normal. A lot of centers use it. Uh, I've seen at one center, I won't name, uh, there after the child was operated, a plaster was applied to the patient's uh, arms. See the oh, God. <laughs> arms, 
<laughs> and when the child was shifted to the uh, post anesthesia care unit and i you know the mother started uh, you know crying uh, much more why yeah, she probably Obviously, thought sir. that something fracture ho gaya so fracture ho gaya uski to jaan nikal gayi so then it took a lot of time to explain it to her ki nahi kuch galat nahi hua bhai just relax ye is isliye kara hai ki bachcha jo hai apne haath ke sath apna line winder nikal le aur is jaa ke kat hai wahan pe na this is a bahut important point hai but usually splinting helps you know yes anything more than that is usually not required if the pain relief is good and all the child not thrash around slight sedation and then put a splint or a boxing glove kind of a thing and ensure that the line doesn't come out sir and very difficult to put a line in a thrashing child in the post op you know so it's it's a complete nightmare so it's better to have the line affected and then the child shifted out rather than uh, yeah Trouble. very true yeah uh, dr Poot, uh, dr punam uh, you know yes, i would sir. like you also uh, to join uh, the discussion here uh, dr anju has mentioned about uh, monitoring ecg their pulse rate is there anti calcification temperature and everything is there uh, what is your uh, you know take on monitoring the uh, the airway pressure do you monitor airway pressures regularly uh, in 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 small children or not so uh, with the kind of anesthesia workstations that we have the airway pressures are automatically there on the screen whether we want them or not they are there so this gives us a very good guide and yeah. as ma'am also said that at the time that uh, we are uh, fixing the tube or we are positioning the patient before surgery we always tend to take the bag in our hand so that we have a better feel of the airway pressure though it <clears throat> when it's on the machine we can see it there and we never let it rise uh, uh, if uh, during packing or uh, during positioning there is a sudden rise in airway pressure then we do alert the surgeon but at that time most of the time we have the bag in our hands and we get a better feel so we do monitor the airway pressure mm -hmm. in all uh, children yeah I, i agree that in case you are manually ventilating the child suddenly you will find that the compliance of the bag has changed and that you know any expert and a physiologist will uh, figure out that you know there is a sudden change which has occurred and that very often happens when the uh, mouth bag is placed uh, uh, and and uh, you know suddenly of course when you look at the monitor it is displaying all right but generally we do not pay much attention to it ke airway pressure ke koi zarurat nahi baaki panch cheezon ko main monitor kar hi raha hu everything is fine nothing to worry about but i think airway uh, monitoring airway pressure is a, is a very good indicator of uh, alarming us of the possibility of some sort of airway obstruction which may be occurring or uh, even when, when when the tube gets pulled off you know yes, uh, suddenly there will be a, 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 the pressures would uh, change yes. so this is another thing i have seen uh, there is more and more literature coming about with regard to the, uh, the significance of monitoring uh, you know uh, airway pressure uh, uh, okay Uh, with regard to uh, the intraorbital block, uh, Doctor uh, Ekta, uh, you know, uh, do you use ultrasound also? Because I have seen uh, some studies which where they are using uh, ultrasound for uh, you know putting up uh, intraorbital nerve block. You are on mute, uh, Doctor Ekta. Kindly, yeah, kindly unmute. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I don't have much experience of ultrasound of intraorbital block, but yes, it is being uh, it is being given at many of the centers. But uh, I am not aware. My, I'm not expo. I have not much experience. Okay. That. Okay. Although uh, the the way you describe it seems uh, very simple and uh, it's, it's quite a superficial, uh, yes, uh, you know, nerve. And you can uh, very often anterior child is very chubby. you can uh, uh, often feel the intraorbital foramen as well and once you feel the intraorbital foramen uh, foramen uh, it's not very difficult for you to position the needle there uh, right at the exit uh, where the nerve nerve comes out from so uh, yes uh, i think there there are some studies which are there uh, with the use of ultrasound uh, guided uh, intraorbital nerve block this will position the drug exactly where you need it because otherwise Uh, however clinically expert you may be of putting in the blocks uh, uh, one thing is when you see it and you can direct your needle right at the target and the other thing is you make a judgment okay yahan pe kahi hai you know other centimeter other or 2 mm the 4 mm the so in that case uh, there is a possibility of uh, uh, being little away sometimes 
But okay. yes, ultrasound is something I think uh, we will hear more and more about the ultrasound use uh, for infraorbital nerve block. Another thing which uh, I uh, probably uh, uh, didn't uh, listen to, uh, you know, uh, with regard to pain management, was the use of suppositories. Uh, quite a few centers, uh, since I keep uh, going for uh, uh, smile train, uh, you know, assignments for uh, different centers. So I've seen some of the centers use positively uh, as a routine. Uh, you know, any of you uh, can uh, give your Who's opinion. What as a routine, sir? Suppository. Suppository. Okay, suppositories, right. Yeah. So we have been using a uh, suppository, like per rectal suppository of paracetamol can be given. I have an experience of that. Like we have given it at the loading dose of 40 milligram per kg at the, just before, at the commence, uh, start, at the end of the surgery, if you give it and pressing the buttock so that it doesn't come out. So uh, uh, it can be given or... Uh, but it is not as good as uh, you know IV paracetamol and uh, other method. But if if IV paracetamol is not available, then this is definitely the yeah. No, I think that's right. Some of uh, sir, we've is... we've been using suppository suppositories for very long, and we don't give it at the end of surgery because it takes time for onset. So after induction and just before you position the baby, at that time the suppository is put. But the use has decreased, one, because of rapid availability and easy availability and safety profile of IV paracetamol. Yeah. And I would also like to emphasize that paracetamol alone is not enough. These surgeries are painful. Even the lip is painful. The palate, of course, because of the periosteum being lifted is a very painful surgery. So paracetamol alone is not enough. It's a good additive uh, in a multimodal technique. But if you give the infraorbital block along with paracetamol or give blocks for the palate and, infra and paracetamol, it works very well. By itself, it may not be a good uh, standalone technique. Yeah, I, uh, I, my, my opinion is quite in line with uh, yours. Uh, I think paracetamol has uh, changed the concept Absolutely. of pain management in small children. Uh, Spolstries, uh, even though some centers are using uh, but I think uh, IV paracetamol is far better. Uh, you know, you're certain of the drug that has gone with paracetamol, yes. with, with the spolstri, sometimes the spolstri comes out. Yes. Sometimes yes. it doesn't go deep enough. It is lying just at the inner watch. And uh, the absorption is, is largely erratic. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, that's another very uh, strong point against the use of spolstri because uh, you, you know, in case you have given the spolstri and the child is still crying, you are thinking in terms of uh, this many yes. milligrams per kg body weight I've already given it. Should I yes. give it more yes. or not? So, you know, you remain in some sort of suspense. So, spostry, well, yes, in case IV paracetamol uh, is not available, certainly spostry uh, can be a, a, a option. Uh, let me see in the so chat. There are a couple of questions in the chat yes. box. Now, uh, I don't know how to answer them in the uh, chat because, because they will not reach the... We are not connected to the delegates. Okay, so okay. But I'll, I'll answer them here. I'll, I'll read the questions for you. This is one. Uh, could you please elaborate more about the endotracheal tube fixation by Dr. Shamik Nandi? So anyone can uh, take that uh, question. How to I, fix endotracheal tube? Yes, yeah. the endotracheal tube for the lip is fixed on the lower lip usually. And it has to be fixed very carefully in the center. And make sure that when the tape is put, it does not drag the lip to either side because that will distort the anatomy and the centralization of the tube is important. Even for the palate, the tube is fixed on the lower margin. Usually the Oxford tube was used. Otherwise, we use RAE tube. And when the tube is put, uh, uh, is, is attached to the circuit, make sure the circuit is well supported at the chin with the help of cost pieces or cotton pads so that uh, the drag does not occur. So tube fixation is one of the very, very important. But, and as you've already highlighted, the tube will come out in your hand the moment positioning takes place if you don't fix it well. And always account for the fact that some amount, maybe half a centimeter will come out uh, uh, with acute positioning when you have this severe extension which is put for the palate so account for that when you fix the tube in very true i think uh, this is one of the most important factors crucial point sir very crucial point and uh, dr nadi has uh, brought it out thank you thank you dr nadi uh, there are some centers where i have seen that you know apart from fixing the tube with uh, the plaster that we use uh, dinoplast yes. or uh, whatever they put a transparent uh, uh, film on that. 
you know, a decisive, uh, transparent film on that because you know you have fixed the tube, but the surgeon has his own way of doing things. So he will he will uh, put a huge uh, amount of betadine and this uh, to clean the process. And by the time he finishes cleaning up, and the the, the tube uh, plaster keeps coming off. Coming so off. So to to prevent that, uh, some transparent dressing can. It depends on the surgeon if some surgeon is kind. So it's okay, but in case uh, you know, so they're uh, all the same. They're, <laughs> they're all the quite. I, I don't want to say that, but they're. I, I think I fully agree with you. They are quite the same. Another question which uh, Dr. Nandi has is that how is supraglottic airway device used in pallet surgery, which uh, is used? Will it not would, hinder the surgery like to, by? I would of, like to answer that. Yeah. Uh, see, a uh, supraglottic device is used not as a prime. You can't leave it in C two because it's a pallet surgery. There is not enough space uh, uh, to get it done. So the supraglottic device may be used for oxygenation. It may be used as a conduit for intubation and may also be used as a rescue device. So these days there are a lot of devices which are designed for intubation and available in pediatric sizes. So you have the Ambu Aura Gain, the Ambu Aura Eye, the Eye Gel, the Blockbuster. These are meant for intubation. They are designed to allow fiber optic guided intubation. Air Q is not very commonly available, but the rest of the devices, including eye gel, are available. So you put the device in, ventilate, anesthetize, oxygenate, and then intubate under fiber optic guidance through the, uh, the, the supraglottic device. You can use it as a rescue device if your laryngoscopy is failing. However, when I was searching the literature, I came across a very interesting article by Dr. Kundra. Uh, published, I think, in 2019, where he's done a randomized controlled trial and he's compared a supraglottic device uh, with an endotracheal tube for palate surgery. Now, I don't have much experience and I'm a little skeptical because uh, what in that study, it's a first generation device he's used, a flexible LMA. Uh, how palate surgery can be done with just a supraglottic device, not because the device is not safe, the device may be safe, but you need to pack. Where will you pack with a supraglottic device? So I have my reservations and I would advise that if you need to secure the airway, do it with an endotracheal tube, but you can easily do it through the supraglottic device. Quite right. Uh, yeah, uh, we are running uh, short of time. So I'll quickly run through uh, the other question. Yeah, Next there are quite a lot of yeah. questions. Uh, not quite a lot, so uh, take it easy. Uh, the, what is the role of dex in cleft surgery? This is again by Dr. Shamik Nandi. Very useful oh. as a pre-medicant. Very, very useful. I use it very frequently, sir. And I'd like to put it on record that the uh, fear of uh, bradycardia with dex med uh, intranasally or orally is exaggerated. There may be some amount of decrease in heart rate, but that's beneficial in a child who's wailing out loud and crying and you know being separated from the mother. It decreases the secretions also. And it does not translate into hypotension, even if there is slight bradycardia. So it has a role in pre-medication. Okay, there's uh, another one. It's a long question. I'm trying to figure out what exactly the information required. It says, uh, uh, Madam, since you have mentioned that bag and mask will be difficult in such patients, do we have an alternative? especially if we decide to not intubate the child, just needs to be sedated by Dr. Ananya Sharma. Yeah, I read that. This is a little vague because this doesn't mention what child and for which surgery. Yeah. If you need to do a palate surgery, you can't do it under sedation. If you need to do a lip surgery, that also you can't do it under sedation. You need endotracheal intubation, which as I mentioned, can be done through the supraglottic device. But if this child needs some other procedure, Say he's come for an uh, echo or he's come for an MRI or he's come for a diagnostic procedure, then you can use the supraglottic device for ventilation and oxygenation and sedate the child. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, one last question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll give you a breather. Uh, I can uh, call in Dr. Poonam Motiani. Of course, you can uh, join as well. Uh, what is better, spontaneous or controlled ventilation for cleft uh, surgeries? Uh, this no, is one no Dr. Jyoti Rama. Sir, controlled ventilation. There controlled is, ventilation no is doubt. to be preferred no, for no. all children, especially those with cleft lip palate. Yeah. Uh, it'll otherwise increase the work of breathing. There'll be airway collapse, and uh, it has to be increase the PaCO2, sir. Eventually, in a child, the twenty PSCO2 minutes in spontaneous ventilation, you'll have the, the CO2 building up, and that's going to cause increase in bleeding. So there is hardly any place of spontaneous ventilation in yeah. pediatric surgeries now. 
I think uh, gone are the days when spontaneous absolutely used to be there, and uh, I fully agree with uh, you. Uh, I think uh, that's the end of uh, the questions that we have had. Uh, well, uh, all good things uh, must come to an end. It's already uh, going to be nine o'clock. That's the limit that we have uh, set for uh, the time. Uh, thank you so much, the three speakers. You have been wonderful people. Uh, in spite of the fact that I didn't give you much time, you have, you have done, <laughs> a, done, done a wonderful job. I must say, I mean, I'm personally obliged to all three of you and uh, I have no words, but for thank want you, of sir. better thank words, the, I can only say thank you very much for this. Thank you, Dr. Thank Anusha. you for the thank opportunity, you, Dr. sir. Thank, thank you, sir. you, Dr. It's Poonam. been a pleasure thank interacting you. with you thank and you, with Dr. the rest Dr. of the people. And uh, on behalf of uh, the President Indian College of Anesthesiologists, Dr. B. Radhakrishnan and my colleague, uh, CEO, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jashiri Sood, uh, you know, I uh, as a form, you know, in, in a formal manner, thank you once again and thanks all, thank all the uh, people who have joined or who have watched this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, till we meet next Wednesday again, uh, you know, stay happy, stay healthy. God bless. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Good night. Bye. And thank Good you, Poonam. Night. And thank you, Ekta. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining thank and you being in this session. And uh, good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. We are closing here. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.